Hello, this is Pat Lynch, and you are listening to the Career Pathways Podcast. Uh, we, As always, we come to you each week with great faculty members from uh, Lyon College, and today is no exception. We have Dr. Radek Shulga uh, joining us. He's a professor of economics. He's going to have a whole bunch of interesting stuff to talk about. And we can't get the podcast going without also hearing deep, deep, way, way back in the background, producer Jason. Hello. Say hello. Hi, producer Jason. So, I feel like he needs a nickname. Bro, well, I guess producer Jason. Producer Jason. Jason for now, but you know, maybe our listener, list, all our listeners can uh, you know, comment and tell us what we should call Jason. It's you know, kind of, if you PG-13 watched, rated, please. Have you ever listened to a <laughs> car talk? Yes. And they have those fake names at the yep. end, right? There you go. Maybe something like that for him. Okay, so... It's a witty pun. A wi- yeah. But, all right. So, Roddick, welcome. Mm-hmm. Good to be here. All right. We always kick things off uh, just asking uh, everyone about about themselves. Okay. Kind of, you, like, you like where where you where you're from, where you went to school, kind of... All the things that took place to lead you here to Lyon College. Okay. Well, I was uh, I was born in Poland, um, and I lived under communism until 1986 when I came over here All right. with my family. Um, we lived in Cleveland for two years. Then we moved to Alabama, mm-hmm. uh, Auburn, uh, War Eagle. And then I went to high school undergrad uh, at Auburn. I was a history undergrad, actually. Um, then I went for a master's in economics at Miami University of Ohio. Yep. And then I got a PhD at University of California, Davis. I taught for a while at Carleton in Minnesota and then came over here to Lyon College. Well, yeah. When you came over from uh, Poland, you, how old were you? I was 11. 11. Yeah. Now, did you speak any English at that I time? I spoke zero English. I maybe knew my name is Radek Sulga. Yeah, really. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's then, about it. <laughs> but and yeah. did you uh, what? What uh, was what was the choice for Cleveland? Uh, was it um, a family or it uh, was? Uh, my father got a job there at Case Western. Oh right, right. So, yeah. Okay. And so you you then you went to public school, I guess. I went to public schools. Yeah. With no English. No English. Okay. Did you do like ESL? In your uh, there was some. There was a class. I remember this class uh, that they had us attend. It was me and my sister and two Japanese kids. Yeah. And we were all supposed to be learning English. Um, I don't remember learning English in it, but I picked it up really quick just because you kind of have to. Yeah. Like, I think within three months, I was fine. And was there uh, like a Polish enclave in Cleveland? I know growing up in Detroit, Hampton there, there was, was uh, uh, big. a lot of that enclave, though, was kind of like older generations. Yeah. And, there are actually significant cultural differences between like the different yeah. waves. Uh, so, you, know, so you have like the Poles that came here like um, you know, during the Great Migration, Ellis Island, nineteen mm-hmm. twenties. You have the Poles that came here right after World War Two. Right. You have the Poles that came here uh, in nineteen sixty eight. You have the Poles that came here during communism, right. or, like after martial law in Poland. That's kind of the part that we were part of, and then so on. So every one of those groups is somewhat different, and I don't think we really kind of fit in at the time yeah. with the other, with the Polish diaspora. Yeah. Um, so like most of my parents' friends were actually other academics yeah. um, from all over the world. What, was your family able to leave Poland on its own or did you have to sneak yeah, out? Yeah, uh, we, we did because, yeah. uh, so my dad came over here um, basically on a teaching yeah. uh, visa. And initially it was temporary and then it we applied and, and I'm, I'm actually not sure how the places yeah. work because I was a little kid, but right. we, we got the green card. Yeah. And yeah. I know. I remember we had to uh, actually, because you have to apply for a green card from outside the country. Mm-hmm. So we had to leave the United States and we like lived in Toronto for two weeks to a month yeah. as we applied. Yeah, that was a long time ago. So yeah. Amazing. Uh, here at Lyon, what, class, what classes, courses do you teach? Uh, so currently, I'm teaching multinational financial management that Jason, pro, uh, producer Jason, is in. Yes, right. We were just talking about his test, kind of. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was the, that was the humorous part of the show. So. Yeah, 
Yeah, they just had a test uh, today. Um, I'm also teaching game theory. Uh, I teach intermediate macroeconomics and principles of economics. Uh, during the fall semester, I usually teach econometrics um, and quantitative methods, so really math heavy. Yeah. And usually I do some kind of other elective. I've taught labor economics, sports economics, behavioral economics. Um, after a while, you kind of like, you can almost do, teach almost anything. Anything with economics. Yeah. Well, speaking of economics, uh, you know, I, I know you and I talked, to, uh, um, you know, that your expertise in international. That was my original yeah. expertise, yeah. Yeah, and uh, amongst many. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, kind of assess things globally right now because, you know, you here, you know, here we have the U.S. and supposedly we have one of the best performing economies, but if you ask the average person, they're not yeah. exactly thinking that, but you have Russia as a pariah state, China, you know, it's kind of, you, you don't know really, it's, well, the growth is slowed, you just don't know, yes, you know, and what. Uh, they're having yeah. a bit of a housing problem, Yeah, right? just like we do, and uh, potential for a big crash, actually, I think. Yeah, so how did, uh, how, when you, kind of look at all that and put it together. Yeah, I mean, like, honestly, I think America's actually doing pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is not an opinion you hear often, uh, and I think that's mostly because of social media. Like, uh, these days, just being positive on social media does not get you clicks or views. Right. Right. It's like everybody's trying to outdoom each other. Right, right. But you have lowest unemployment in, you know, however long you have. Inflation was a problem, but right. it has come down significantly. It's still, I think, a little bit above what the Fed wants it to be. Um, yeah. So I believe it's about three and a half percent. They went down to two, but they're pretty much on track on getting there. Um, wages have risen, real wages adjusted for inflation, not for everyone, but they have definitely risen at the bottom of the pay scale, right? Um, which is also very rare. We haven't had that happen really since the nineties. Yeah. Uh, so this like inequality. If you know, if you're concerned about inequality, inequality has actually fallen a lot in the past yeah. couple of years. Um, interest rates are high, but you know, then if you've lived through the eighties, yeah, they're actually not that high. Yeah. I've, so I think it's a combination of people just getting stuff from social media, which is all about negativity and also kind of don't have a good benchmark to compare things to. Right. Um, you know, like if you think interest rates are high now, you know, at seven, eight percent, then look at 1980s where they were like 15%. Yeah. Same thing with inflation, right? You think 4%, 5% inflation is high? Look at the 80s and the 70s. Yeah. It was double digits. Um, and But, you know, that's like long in the past. People kind of forgotten it. Sure. Also, you know, Americans, it's true, we don't really pay attention to other countries that much. But you look at UK and compared to us, they're doing horrible. Yeah, What what's what's the problem with the U? Because, well, I guess they... They kind of mm -hmm. shot themselves in the foot, didn't they, with Brexit and uh, and then you know it just. Anything to export or really any, like what do they export? What's their largest export? Um, I don't even know. I actually don't know off the top of my head what they export. Uh, but I'm pretty every country, every advanced economy exports yeah. plenty of stuff. So I don't think that's the issue. Um, and Brexit is kind of old, right? That predates yeah. yeah the pandemic. Um. So first thing, this is another thing that people don't know, is actually the United States, we had much more aggressive fiscal and monetary policy during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people complain about small stimulus bills, but yeah. stimulus checks, but compared to any other countries, they're very generous. Right. Um, Europe has this long tendency also, and actually Britain a bit less than the Germans, but um, to really, really keep interest rates high because they're very mm -hmm. scared of inflation. Uh, whereas in the United States, the Fed is a lot more flexible about it. Right. Right. The Fed has the dual mandate of ensuring price stability and full employment. Mm -hmm. uh, but something like the European Central Bank, they only care about price stability. They never look at unemployment. Right. So part of it, I think, is that they just let things get worse during the pandemic and they're still suffering from it. Yeah. Um, what What impact does the world economy have with Russia kind of being a pariah state. I don't I don't know if they were really that much of an economic factor to begin with, you know. Not that much. Yeah. Um, oil, right? oil. Yeah, but look at the oil prices, they're not particularly high, right? Mm -hmm. I mean 
seen higher. They're not super low either. Um, United States is really actually is pretty much uh, energy independent. Right. Uh, we would probably be exporting oil if there wasn't laws that regulations that prevent us from exporting yeah. oil, right? Because we want to build up the strategic reserve and all that. So we don't. I think before the Ukraine war, uh, only like one percent of our oil came from Russia itself. Yeah, something really small. It's mostly um, like your like Western Europe, right? They, yes, yeah. it was Germany and yeah. France that were importing yeah. a lot, and now even that's gone down uh, because. They're all alternatives, and yeah. you know, when, when one thing goes down, somebody's going to step in and try to fill that up. So yeah. I don't think Russia has much of an impact on the world economy. Kind of the question is reversed, is how much the sanctions and all that mm -hmm. is affecting the Russian economy. Now, you know, what, what I've read is that it's not really having that big of an impact, that they've found ways with other partners, India, for instance, and... Uh, you know, then you, you you got like a North Korea, whatever, you know, whatever. I, I don't know if that, that's much for of arms. A partner. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you, they, yeah. they need plenty of those, but, yeah. uh, but they found ways, maybe possibly China, I guess, would be the, the big one that uh, they've been able to get around the sanctions. So one thing is that happened before the war. Uh, so between essentially 2014, when Russia first uh, attacked Ukraine and 2022, yeah. Second invasion is they made sure to really build up their stock of foreign reserves mm -hmm. and kind of financially prepare for the war. Right, um, and that's part of the reason why we haven't seen a big financial crash in Russia or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And their war chest was kind of yeah. big to begin with. Um, I do think sanctions are having an effect, but if you're thinking that they're enough to crash an economy like Russia, I don't think that's going to happen. Right, sanctions always kind of a very Sloppy weapon. Like with Iran, how long has that been going yeah, on? Yeah, right. And so, yeah. yeah, this is a good example. Like, we've got sanctions on Iran forever. And yeah. Nothing happens. Yeah. They get protests every once in a while. But, sure. You know, if you're authoritarian, you just squash them. And yeah. Keep going. Who doesn't like a death to the U.S. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. rally? <laughs> right. And uh, the, um, you know, with speaking of Ukraine, in from an, economist point of view you, you know the bill is stalled mm -hmm. right now but when I, I was reading that if you look at where the money is spent a lot of the money isn't like we're just giving this carte blanche check yeah. to the ukraine it's it's actually going to u.s industry yep. to supply you know to replenish weapons and ammunition right there, there's really Maybe three types of aid. Yeah. The first type of aid is we're just shipping our old equipment to them, right? Yeah. We're taking stuff out of storage yeah. that we'll never use, that we pay, probably have to pay scrap costs right, for. Right, And we're just, here, take this old tank that yeah. you know, has been sitting in a warehouse for the past 10 years. And that will probably sit there for another 10 years unless you use it. Yeah. So a good chunk of that aid is really just old equipment. Uh, another good chunk is things like ammunition that you mentioned. Right, right. And because that we were short on and yeah. they're short on. Um, and that does go to American industry because that's who produces those things, right? Uh, then there's some humanitarian aid and some uh, aid to kind of like just keep the government operation. Right. And that's probably where like you could say that is the money we're actually given. Them. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a fairly small chunk of the overall aid. Yeah, because Ukraine aid in a way is a stimulus because uh, the way military yeah. contracting, don't they spread it out over a number of states? Yeah, for, for the yeah. places that have military bases, that yeah. have uh, military producers, yeah. uh, they're definitely have a simultative effects, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the fair, the, um, not, it, it's, it might sound like a political question, but I want it from an economist. What, what is by, the Biden administration doing right and what is it doing wrong? And economics? Yes. Um, I think the infrastructure bill is really good. Mm -hmm. um, some, uh, some of the things are a judgment call and really depends on your kind of ideological and political views. Right. So things like the child tax credit, loan forgiveness, yeah. right? Um, this might sound kind of paradoxical, but as an economist, I don't feel qualified to evaluate them. Right. They are economic issues, but they're also essentially a matter of your worldview. Right? Right. Economists can talk about, okay, is that the best way to achieve a particular goal? But when you're discussing what the goal is, right, that's up to you. Right. Um, so you might agree with them because you support, you know, support yeah. uh, 
a social safety net. Sure. You might be ideologically opposed to social safety net, and you don't like it. Right? Yeah. How would you describe Bi Bidenomics? What, what? So I think in investment in infrastructure is a big part of it. So that's, and, and that's kind of that departure from Reaganomics, right? Which yes, was, yeah. yeah, so, yep. Okay, and Reaganomics was? Deregulation and tax cuts. That's All right. what Reaganomics was. And that, and, and in doing that, you unleash the, the market, the market, and, and it's going to create yeah. jobs, and yeah, and then that's the that that's the trickle down uh, theory, I guess. That yeah. So the trickle down theory. This is like in economics, there's no such thing as trickle down theory. This is a popular right. term that people use. Well, what um, the, uh, the Laffer curve or whatever. Yeah, the Laffer okay. talking, covered the Laffer curve yeah. in principles the other day. Yeah. Um, so all these things like trickle down or supply side economics or Laffer curve. Um, they are partly based on the economic concepts. It is true that you can have a tax rate so high that you'd actually make raise more revenue by having a lower tax. Right. And that's basically what the Laffer curve is. The question is, do we have taxes so high that if we cut them, we'd raise more money, that right. they would pay for themselves? And the answer to that is really no. None of them are that high. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's some obscure tax on some particular good or something right, like that. Right. But generally speaking... You know, higher taxes, more revenue, lower taxes, less revenue. Yeah, it always concerned me, the laugh curve, at least the story goes, he wrote it on like a yeah, napkin. Yeah, <laughs> the, actually, the idea itself the, yeah. goes back to um, Alfred Marshall and David Ricardo even. Okay, so... It's an old him, idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and like I said, theoretically, it's a sound argument. It just depends on which side of the curve you're on. Yeah. yeah. Now, I get with Reag Reaganomics, the, the part, though, is that they... They also just dramatically increased spending as well, and that yes. so they reduced taxes, but they didn't modif they didn't moderate spending, and so you kind of had things going in the wrong direction. This is where I can do that on one hand, on the other hand, <laughs> fire away. <That's> a <laughs> yeah, the economist thing. Yeah, no. Um, so on the one hand, yes. Um, the first round of Reagan tax cuts, which I believe. Actually, I don't know if it was the first round. The one that passed in 1987, mm -hmm. it actually had bi bipartisan support. Right. Um, because a lot of what it did was actually kind of just rationalize the tax code. Right. Um, get rid of some loopholes. You close loopholes, but you cut the rate. Right? right. So the effective tax rate can stay the same, but now you're just uh, creating less bad incentives. Right. Um, so people are on board with that. Um so that was kind of the positive aspect of it. The negative aspect was that it, it actually did make it less progressive mm -hmm. uh, and it did lower revenue um, while at the same time spending was being increased because of uh, most of military spending in the Cold yeah. War, right? Yeah. And um, again, that kind of comes down to ideology. Like, yeah. Um, do you, it also comes down to the question of like what role did – Reagan's military build up play in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Was that a yeah. crucial factor or would they have collapsed anyway? Right. Yeah, that's another, that's another podcast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, um, with Bidenomics, like, and you have something like the chips act. So mm -hmm. it's reinvesting to bring technology in, in like investment yeah. here in the U S. Uh, is that, it's like you're 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 building infrastructure into the U.S., which is a positive. But is there a, a protectionist aspect to that? There definitely is. Okay, um, and because y'all, some people, I, well, I'll say myself, when I hear protectionism, I I kind of ref reflectively kind of uh oh, you know, that's I, so I, I, I'm a little as an economist, I'm the same way. And yeah, I think most economists are like that. Right, but, but I think these days we're actually kind of the Minority. Okay. I, I think uh, this is like, you know, it's, it's weird how the view of protectionism has changed over time and how it's moved from being a left-wing thing to almost being a right-wing thing. Right. Um, but uh, it definitely, I think, has more support mm -hmm. uh, on both the left and right right now. And um, things like uh, the Chips Act and so on, they do have, definitely have elements of protectionism. Right. Likewise, notably, actually, Biden kept in place some of Trump's protectionist policies, right. tariffs, and so on. Um, so I think that's kind of shared between the parties. So are are we 
are we better off kind of removing those or are we, is that just, you know, like, I guess the technical way is, are we just becoming chumps, you know, in terms of being taken, you always hear U S is being taken advantage of. And so we need to, yeah, that's not true. China. <laughs> well, yeah. So with, with China, the, the problem is the technology right. stealing, supposed technology yeah. stealing. Now, um, there's some of that definitely going on at the same time. Basically, these companies make a deal, right? The Chinese say, you come here, you set up your shop, mm -hmm. you're going to give us access to your technology. Right. All right. So it's not like anybody's getting fooled or they don't know what they're getting into. Right. right? It's kind of the price of operating in China. Um, and honestly, countries have done that long before China. Um, right. You know, Japanese growth in the 60s and 70s was basically them backwards engineering a lot of American technology. Right. Uh, it's just we're kind of more bothered with by it when China does it, right? Because they're kind of well, the, yeah, Japan, rival, they, yeah. Right? Well, and Japan didn't have this increasing military and, yeah. and aggressive posture that yeah, yeah. Uh, the Chinese are and taking every day. Yeah. Well, the Japan, 1950s, yeah. yeah 1950s. But, oh, right. But but, but by even the 80s, yeah. everybody was frightened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the big scare in the 80s was Japan. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. it was, you know, and I, growing up in, in Michigan, yeah, that oh, was, yeah. oh, yeah, they were, they were was out it, to was kill Was that us. movie with Gung Ho? Yep, yep, uh, yeah, the, at the car, yeah, the yeah. car company in the U.S. And uh, I worked for a Japanese uh, a firm, Kao, mm -hmm. of, and, and we were, like, we were purchased by them, so we had, you know, we had, like, our own little mini Gung Ho all the time. Oh, yeah. Trying to understand each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, shift gears, did, you know, as far as changes in the economy due to technology. Oh, yeah. So uh, one thing is uh, Bitcoin now is kind of like over $60,000. You know, it's just had a, uh, like. It, it broke a new high, but then it crashed again, I thought. Yeah, but it's up 50% for this year. And, uh, and now Fidelity and mm. some of these, they're kind of le legitimizing yeah, you know, crypto and kind of it, what's an economic viewpoint as far as I don't know if you call it alternative currency or, or I mean, where's that going or is that just a nice, easy way? For, so, a lot of it is just a straight up scam. <laughs> so, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, Dogecoin, all that stuff, like it's basically just a form of gambling, right? Right, right. And you know what, like, if you want to gamble. Your business, right. I'm not going to judge you, but don't pretend you're doing investing because it's not investing. Right. I think with a couple of the big ones like Bitcoin, Ethereum, there might be some economic justification for mm -hmm. them. You know, they're going to serve as an alternative means of payment. Um, you know, people have a preference of whether you use your uh, debit card or use cash. Right. So, might, you know, so in addition to that, you might be also be paying Bitcoin. So I think there's some legitimate demand for those. But also, let's be honest, a lot of it is really about the underground economy and yeah. tax evasion and right. sketchy stuff on the web. Right? right, right. That's where a lot of the demand comes from. Yeah. And then on top of that, you got this huge amount of money sitting there that's all just speculative. Right? Yeah, and it just becomes that fear of missing out because, yeah. you know, I mean, I literally every day see how much, you, you know, they it's like in my news feed, it, it, they have a little thing with all the stock index. And then you can see, you know, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin yeah. just keeps growing and, you think should I invest? But I have, no, I still don't have a clear concept on really what what that what that currency is. So I just avoid it. I think one way to put it is this way: yeah. if you're investing in stock market, it is at least theoretically possible for all stocks to go up and for everybody to make money. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen just because right. probability would be really close to zero. Right. But it's not a zero sum game because what those stocks represent is the underlying productivity of the economies. Uh, mm -hmm. of the companies that are being traded, right? Um, but with crypto, it's a zero-sum game. Right. If somebody made 100000 that means somebody lost 100000 mm -hmm. right? yeah, So you can always find that person that, oh, yeah, you made yeah. so much money, Yeah. but then you're going to find that person who lost it. Yeah. It's just the person who lost is not going to go around bragging about it. Right, right. But yeah. the person, so yeah, but the person who made the money is going to tell all their friends. Because they, they, yeah. what they do is anybody can make Crypto, so you make your own crypto, and you know, then you get Elon Musk to say, We're going to the moon, right? And right. Then and then everybody invests in it, and you're like, Here's all that money, give it well, to me. Well, and then you cash out and yep, you leave out. Yeah. There's one uh, 
South American country, right? That they, El Salvador. They, yeah, that it's their official currency. They adopted it, and but now I think they kind of regret it. Well, now they might be liking it again. Yeah, it's good. That's it's, it's silly. Well, so first of all, El Salvador actually uses the American dollar as its currency. Right. Right. Um, but they also tried adopting Bitcoin. But you know, you want a stable currency. Yeah. For purposes of because. People are gonna need to buy groceries and just boring everyday stuff. You don't need something that's Zero super grocery. volatile. Well, yeah. with going to a stable currency, I when I I was taking econ, you know, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, you know, my, I remember my professor just w would go on and on about the mistakes we made moving away from the gold standard. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Most economists are anti-gold standard. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, I, my, my luck of the draw, I got this guy, yeah. you know. Well, so, yeah, because I mean, what was, um, oh, it's got it was Brenton Woods. Is that Brenton Woods? Yeah. 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 So the Brenton Woods system, which was mentioned in class, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a system until 1973 when Nixon yeah. took us uh, out of. A, so that wasn't true gold standard. It was more like a gold backed standard. Right. right? There was no convertibility for. Ordinary people in financial institutions. Mm -hmm. um, it was only designated entities that could trade dollars right, for gold. Right. Unlike the 19th century gold standard, where you could just walk into a bank and say, "Give me, give, give me, me that gold." gold. Yeah. yeah. So that was full, fully convertible. Um, but yeah, Nixon took us out of Bretton Woods in 1973 because of gold outflows. He first tried price controls. He tried tariffs. Uh, it didn't work, and then he basically said, "Hey, it's not worth it." Yeah. yeah. So, and then just moved on. Yeah. So, Jason, what happens if you have a fixed exchange rate and free capital flows? What are you giving up? You're giving up your own monetary. Policy. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the trilemma. <laughs> yeah. Right. The trilemma. The tri. There you are. There you have it. Yeah. In 1973, yeah. you know, the U.S. economy was heading for a recession. Yeah. Nixon probably had some selfish reasons too. Right. He, um, he kind of wanted to boost the economy before. Yeah, to get elected. To get reelected. Yeah. He actually, this is a famous, kind of famous story among economists, how he tried to bu bully the uh, the chair of the Fed at the time, Arthur Burns. Burns. Yeah. yeah, Arthur famous, Burns, yeah. into uh, cutting interest rate right before the election. Yeah. To make it easier to win. Uh, and that probably played a part in his decision, but I think most economists today would say that was the right choice. Yeah. He might have made it for the wrong reason, but it was the right thing to do. Well, you know, then you kind of flash forward to you know, kind of the 2010s, and I, I guess this was like, um, gosh, uh, Bush, Obama, that they, like, um, uh, um, like easing, what it was like. Quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. Yep. What is quantitative? Yeah, policy. it was like it's all, yeah. like, and I guess it was keep interest So this was 2007, lower. right? You have the okay, financial right, crash. Right, 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 right. Um, and the housing market crash, which then spreads to the financial markets, and uh, Lehman Brothers goes under AIG. Right, right. right? Um, and so basically what usually Fed does in a recession is try to cut the interest rate. Mm -hmm. And the interest rate they usually cut is the federal funds rate, right? which is the interbank overnight rate. It's basically what banks charge Move each other you, overnight. Yeah. So it's a very short-term interest rate. Mm -hmm. The problem was that because everybody was so scared, after that housing crash and the financial crash that nobody wanted to lend. Yeah. So essentially the market ceased to exist. Oh, right? okay. Like you go into this market and you want to borrow money, there's nobody willing yeah. to lend no matter what interest you offer them. Right. Right. Um, the other uh, policy that the Fed has is the discount rate. Yeah. Which is banks borrowing directly from the Fed mm -hmm. at the discount rate. And, you know, if they want to simulate the economy, they'll cut that. Problem is that it has kind of a stigma to it. Right. Um, Basically, if a bank comes to the Fed, says, we want to borrow at the discount window, the Fed's going to be like, why aren't you borrowing from private banks? Yeah, why yeah. do you have to come to us? Yeah. Is there something going on with your bank? Right. It's a good way to like uh, invite uh, attention no, okay. from the regulators. Yeah, yeah. So private banks try to avoid it, right? Uh, then the third way that the Fed can try to simulate the economy is the required reserve ratio. Right. Which is basically how much of deposits the banks have to keep. Uh, and as post reserves. 2008, they raised that. Yeah, they, they like, no, safety they net. Well, what? well, once the economy recovered, they raised. Yes, you, you're probably thinking of capital requirements. Yes, it's two yes. different things. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Capital requirements is basically about how much in liquid assets the bank has to have yes. to operate. 
required reserves is how much of their deposits they have to hold at the Fed. Mm-hmm. If you let banks hold less deposits at the re- reserves of the Fed, right, that's more money they can lend out. Mm-hmm. And so that starts circulating. That's supposed to create the stimulus. But um, at that point, basically, banks were holding a lot in reserve anyway, yeah, way well above the required ratio because again, they were scared. Right? Right. Every bank was worried about liquidity and getting a bank run or something. So these markets, these traditional tools of monetary policy, just ceased to work in two thousand eight. Right. Um, you couldn't cut the federal funds rate because no such market existed yeah. anymore. <laughs> You couldn't cut the discount rate because nobody wanted to borrow because they didn't want the stigma. Right. And you cut the required reserve ratio, but so what when they want to hold more than that anyway? So they switched to so-called unorthodox monetary policy. There's quantitative easing and forward guidance. Right. the other kind. Forward guidance was essentially kind of announcing ahead of time what they're going to do. Right. Like what their kind of long-term plan is, what they're going to do to the interest rate and so on. And that's... Alan Greenspan, was that the kind of... No, that, that was uh, Ben Bernanke. Bernanke, okay, got it, got it, yeah. yeah. And then, okay, uh, quantitative easing was basically, because usually, like I said, the Fed yeah. targets the short-term interest rate. Mm-hmm. This is where they decided they're actually going to also try to target the long-term interest rate. Right. Because, you know, maybe the federal funds market isn't really liquid, isn't working, but there's still a market for bonds right. and for longer-term assets. So they're going to try to move into those markets, buying some of those assets. Mm-hmm. Uh, to influence that interest rate and hope that they can right. get the economy going that way, it kind of worked. It took a long time. That was yeah. a very that was a that was a very long recovery. Yeah, it yeah. took a long time. Um, yeah. And I guess the third part of it was the TARP, toxic acid relief yeah. program. Yeah. Uh, oh, Jason, curious. yeah. yeah um, speaking of like kind of modern like U.S. Econ- like economic stuff, there's been like a thing recently about like you know student debt. Mm-hmm. Like cancellation stuff, and I want to know from an economics point, right? So let's say like you know they do decide like I, this would never happen, at least not now. But like we're gonna cancel all student debt, all federal right. student debt, right? Every single federal student loan that's ever been taken out is completely forgiven. Mm-hmm. How much would that actually affect the United States economy compared to how how everybody says it? Would? I I think it would have a fairly significant stimulative effect. The problem is like once you hit. You know, three percent, three point five percent unemployment. Uh, there isn't that many excess resources left in the economy. Once yeah. you're like at full employment, a stimulus becomes inflationary yeah. rather than expansionary, right? So there's kind of upper limit to how much you can do uh, to stimulate the economy yeah. uh, with demand side policies, which is what that would be. Um, you know, and it made perfect sense, I think, when we're in a pandemic, mm-hmm. right? Everybody was scared, everybody was at home, savings go up, people are not spending their money, so you have a stimulus then. But once you kind of hit your capacity, any further stimulus is going to just bring back inflation. Uh, so if, if you were going to forgive student loan, that's actually the time was going to probably would have to do it, would have been during the pandemic. Yeah. Now, uh, it might still be a good idea for other reasons, right. on the other hand. Yeah. But... Uh, to stimulate theory, the economy itself. I was going to say, because yeah. in theory, wouldn't that mean that there's more money that people would be able to spend, you know, for other goods? Yes. You know? Yeah. But so, that's, but, the, you know, so people have more money to spend on other goods. So then prices go up. Either prices go up or more goods get produced. Mm-hmm. Once you're using all your resources right. effectively, it's going to be the prices that go up. Yeah. Right. Well, it, one of the pro- problems I, I saw with student uh, loan forgiveness is it seems all the, 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 Everything's stacked for, you know, to advantage boomers like me, (laughs) you know, and it's the, uh, you got, you know, the students that are, you know, college is more and more expensive. They have to take more and more debt to do this. They finally get out uh, and they're in the workforce and now home prices are, you know, as far as home availability, home prices are at an all time high, you know, and it's just all the. I look back at, you know, just, you know, think the affordability of like, you know, I was able to get a home yeah. know, right out of business school. That My daughter makes decent money and pff, forget yeah. it. You know, it just, it's not there. I think all those things are true. Yeah. Also, I think they're somewhat exaggerated in social media discussions sometimes. So with housing, uh, for yeah. example, one thing that's happened is average or median home uh, has gotten much bigger. Right. It went from like 1,000 square feet to almost yes. 2,000. So like right. the size of a median home has actually doubled almost. Right. And that explains part of this difference in prices. Right. 
Having said that, it is still true that housing prices are still much, much, much higher than, you know, they've, they've gone up regardless of that. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of that really has to do with local policies, not any kind of national policies. Yeah, you mean like NIMBY, NIMBYism? And yeah, restrictions on yeah. New, new housing supply, yeah. kind of existing homeowners protecting their property values but not allowing more housing to be built. Right. But, you know, these are like local city councils and maybe yeah. state legislatures up to some point. And if you have a problem with that, that's who you should be complaining to. Right. Right. Uh, with student student tuition, yeah, I actually talked quite a bit about that in principles. But again, it's true tuition has gone up, but you know, so has financial aid that is given, right? Including grants. I'm just let's forget about loans, but just consider financial aid to be grants. But even once you adjust for grants, it has gone up. Yeah. So again, it is true. Not as cause sometimes people look at just the tuition, and that's you know that's exploded. Right. But financial aid has also gone up. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, with that, you know, I think initially it was driven by increases in demand for college. Right. Um, and for a while there, colleges were kind of flush with new students and yeah. were actually benefiting. All these students bring in their financial aid packages. Right. Right. So tuition went up. Um, but most colleges aren't really for profit businesses. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's good in some respects, but it also means that they can do really dumb things. Uh, financially, was well, there any four credible for profit colleges out there now? I, there are, I mean, so Phoenix, got rid yeah, I think Phoenix is still around. Yes, it is. It got bought by a, um, yeah, a, oh gosh, I'm DeVry was like, around, yeah, yeah, but DeVry's getting their pants suit off, right? Right, yeah, um, yeah, so those didn't really work well either. <laughs> what about making um, call okay, so, so like you know, like student debt forgiveness, right? That's <coughs> that's tough, but like. Making actually like being like you know what from now on we're gonna just start taxing and we're gonna make college free like we're gonna just start making all school being funded by the federal government. How would that affect the economy? Like, would is there places that we could allocate money in a budget for that? I think so. Community college is like almost free, right? Yeah. And that's and the question is, can you expand that to at least like state schools? Right. You're always gonna have private schools that get to decide what you want, yeah. right? And I guess you could say like, oh, we'll pay your way to private school, but then right. what's going to happen is private school will just raise their tuition, <laughs> right? But like public schools, like the University of like Arkansas or the University of Minnesota, stuff right? Like that. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of the main idea. Is yeah. I I don't know. It's this is something like you'd really want to get detailed on. A lot of European countries have that, but they're also a lot more restrictive, uh, right? About who gets to go to college. Well, now, in your viewpoint, is producer Jason's, what he was describing, is that socialism? Is it? No. <laughs> I, do, I mean, it's social welfare. I was, social, yeah. I was always okay. told by my economics teacher that right. you don't, you don't want to have full, blow, like the whole cake, right? If the whole cake, actually, sorry, ice cream. He always used the ice cream. Yeah. Example. If the whole ice cream was sprinkles, you go, Bleh. I don't like it. But when you put a little bit of sprinkles <laughs> on the ice cream, it's yeah. great. I mean, so, you know, this is def what is socialism? Yeah. I, you look out there on social media and like, I don't know, there's a proposal for a government to build a bridge and yeah. left wings are like, that's socialism. Isn't it great? <laughs> and the right wingers are like, that's socialism. It's horrible. Yeah, government yeah. should be building bridges. Right, right, right. And I'm sitting there going like, it's just the government building a bridge. Right. The government's right. done that forever. You know? Yeah. So it's, so, it's so to me, socialism, the money. <laughs> yeah, to me, socialism or communism means government setting prices, right. deciding where people work. It, it's just another level of control. Than just you know, well, funding a couple things. Now, so. uh, uh, the Biden administration uh, passed this. Uh, this it's like a cap on junk fees, you know, for credit card companies. Oh, yeah. It's mm -hmm. like now the most they can. Yeah, yeah. The most you can charge is eight dollars. Uh, right. So that's obviously a paternalistic policy. Yes. Um, kind of traditional economics would say, you know, who are you to decide? Yeah. Yeah. But I think there's a bunch of stuff in behavioral economics, uh, which kind of highlights the cognitive biases, the irrationalities that right. people tend to have. That would kind of a little bit justify that. Right. Um, with those policies, though, I think you have to always, always be careful of unintended consequences. Right. So kind of the classic example that I used, I don't know if I used that in this class. Right. No. This was, uh, this was actually somebody that, uh, a professor that wrote a paper on this in, in my grad school. It was about ATM bank fees. Yeah. Right? So 
when NTMs first came out, banks would charge like fees if, if you were yeah. a member, right? And yeah. they still do that. Uh, but some banks would charge like $5, $6 for withdrawal. And that got people really riled up. Right. So this guy studied places where the city council passed the cap. Yeah. So no more than $3 for withdrawal. Right. Right. And what he found is that once that got passed, even banks that were charging like $1 for withdrawal or mm -hmm. no fee for withdrawal all of a sudden started charging $3. Yeah. So the cap had kind of an unintended. Uh, yeah. So yeah. then they. You, we, so yeah, yeah, sure. You got rid of those Thank super you. high got, ones. Yeah. But the ones that were lower. Was, yeah. And they could still come out to be the good guy. Yeah. They, they facilitated yeah. collusion among the banks. That's Thank, what it did. Thank you very much. Yeah. So. Well, let, let's. But I think that one's, I think that one's fine. The one you're referring kind to. Kind of change subjects a little bit to something like real easy. Global warming. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> We should shoot methane into the atmosphere. Yep, there you are. Yeah, it's a, but but you know I, how you know that that's one of those that you know we set targets. You know they set mm -hmm. global targets, but then it's kind of the you know how is it with China and India, Africa? That are right. all you know they're in a very different economic stage than Western Europe and the U.S. So how yeah. how is that ever going to be achieved? Um, I think there's kind of equity issues, yeah. which basically, you know, I, I can understand the point of view of some of these poor countries, which right. are basically saying like, hey, you know, you used to be poor, yeah. you polluted the planet, you got rich. Right. You know, now you're going to tell us we can't get rich. Right, you know? right. So I definitely understand that. Um, but at the same time, you know, like realistically, I don't see people in, in the rich countries agreeing to have massive payments to right. people in the poor countries just get them out to police. redistribute yeah we'll yeah. we'll do some like token stuff like oh here's right. some we'll fund some solar panels but mm -hmm. on the scale that it would need to be done it's not going to happen um well I how can it be done because it's you know uh, all of a sudden you be i i, I look at it and i become kind of defeatist that it doesn't seem like it's so possible. the good news is that the faster the faster the country develops the more they care about start caring about environment yeah right um Kind of like China, and you look at yeah, the so you air see, quality in China. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it usually starts with just plain air quality, yeah. you know, smog. Smog used yeah. to be a huge deal in the United States. Nobody ever, you right. never hear about smog. Yeah. Um, American rivers would catch on fire, the Cuyahoga. Yep, in, yep, in, there in you Cleveland, are, right? old home. Man. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, you never right. hear about rivers catching on fire because people started caring about it, and once you know, you're rich enough, you kind of can afford to start cleaning up. Right, right. England got re reforested, right? Right. Um, so the kind of the optimistical view is that if we can get, you know, poor countries to get a little bit richer, then they're going to start taking care of their own mm -hmm. and at least partly solve the problem. Question is, is that going to happen fast enough? Right. right. And that's kind of the big elephant in the room. Yeah. Um, 20 years from now, kind of, you know, looking at how, where things are, uh, kind of where will the world be? Oh, my God. Economically. I mean, like, you know. Like, we'll be richer. Okay. Um, I think one of the stories that people miss and all this doom yeah. and gloom is just tremendous reduction in poverty, world poverty. That yeah. has happened over the past 20 years. Right. Um, I mean, usually China is like, gets highlighted, right? Cause but India has done it as well. India has done it as well. Uh, Bangladesh, even um, a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. Right. Um, so even if you put China and India aside, there has been a very big reduction in mm -hmm. world poverty. Um, usually now famines only occur if there's like a, you know, a civil war, a conflict. Right. Um, the number of people that are like desperately poor has definitely fallen as a share of population and maybe even as yeah. total. Um, but you never like hear about that. Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah. it's positive news. Nobody cares about positive news. The, but like in the, like, is there a point in the future where, you know, all of a, they're now it's, it's now, it's now the China like the beginning of the China century, like with the U S and we're, we're, we're a powerful economy, but we're, we're in more decline. Like, yeah. Or are we more like a UK or uh, something like that? I, I think we're too big. Yeah. Um, population wise, you know, anything can happen, of course. Yeah. I mean, who knows? But, um, I, so if anybody's going to overtake us, maybe European union yeah. put together. Could they ever work? Really? Yeah. Yeah, work together. 
um, China still has a long way to go. Yeah. Right. I mean, maybe militarily they they don't, but like right. as economically, they still have a long way to go. Yeah. Uh, I don't think people realize how big the gap in per capita income is mm-hmm. still between China and the United States. Um. So maybe a block of other nations could right. overtake us, but I think we're gonna be top dog for a while. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh. And by the way, I don't believe in bricks either. You, bricks. Yeah. And, really. No, it's a made-up thing in completely different countries that really have no interest, <laughs> no yeah. common interest. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a marketing <laughs> thing. Love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the um, you know, this is a podcast about careers. Oh yes. So, uh, you know, you uh, for some for our students who are become economics majors, you know, kind of what career options are available for somebody that leaves Lyon with a economics major? So. Almost anything, honestly. It's right. one of the most versatile and sought after majors. Mm-hmm. Um, like basically anything that a business major can get you, economics major can get you, and more. Yeah. Um, so there's, of course, the academic path. Mm-hmm. I would actually not recommend it. Um, Just competitive? Or? It, I don't think an undergrad economics education really. Ex- uh, makes you aware of what is needed to get a PhD in economics. Right. There's a huge jump between undergrad and grad. Right. And that jump is called lots of math. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like serious math, real analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Linear algebra. Just, I mean, all the calculus. You know. I've seen um, some of the stuff you leave at the copier, and I I'm, <laughs> yeah, I and, run from it. And my stuff's like outdated too. <laughs> like the stuff they're doing now. Is, right. Um, it's also it is also very very competitive to get mm-hmm. into these schools. Um. The good news is that, like, if you get a PhD in economics, you you'll do great. Yeah, but it is it's not for everybody. It's you have to love math, you have to love modeling, statistics, and right. be really into it. Um. So for most people, I would not recommend it. Sometimes you do. You do see that sure. student, and you're like, oh yeah, yeah it'd be perfect. But yeah. um, that's not typical. So if you're not gonna do academia, what can you do? Uh, banking, insurance, yeah. obvi- a very obvious, right? Consulting. Um, I was kind of trying to think of some more, like, uh, a little less obvious um, career paths. Yeah. But, um, but it's a flat, it's, it's very it's, flexible. But yeah. yeah. And it's, and it, the flexibility comes from the kind of the rigor and, and the, the, kind of the critical thinking that you need to, yeah, I, to study economics? The combination of kind of like real world applications, right? Because yeah. we're pretty well grounded in right. real world uh, with like the yeah, ability to think abstractly. We like to take real world problems, kind of abstractify them, simplify them, get them down to essentials, try right. to understand them, and then take that back and come up with solutions. Uh, so uh, another career path, uh, any kind of government job. Yep. Right. Economics degree is going to help you a lot with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, nonprofits. Right. Um, uh, so speaking of career paths, you're young, young Roddick, mm-hmm. that you there was a point in time you you were you may have been a musician. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was never a musician. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I, I would not insult other musicians. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you were in a band. Yeah. I was. I was in a band. All right. I played drums. Play drums. Yes. Okay. So were you like a Ginger Baker, John Bonham type drummer or, or a Ringo Starr? Or, or? I, I was like struggling to keep a beat kind of drummer. Yeah, okay, yeah. struggling to keep a beat drummer. Okay. And I could do like maybe one, like two, do, two, do, do, do. That yeah, was my, my drum roll. Oh, man. Okay. What kind of what kind of mu- music were you guys playing? So somebody described us as a, if Marcel Duchamp started a band. Okay. Right. You know Marcel Duchamp? Nope. I, I, that one passed. He was by. a Dadaist. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, artist, right? Yeah. From Dada. So I think that was kind of trying to be saying that something positive about us. Yeah. Okay. We were so bad. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like Dada except music. It's, like yeah. like Sun Ra or John Cage or something like that, you know, where it's just like kind of random noise. I do not wish to insult these people <laughs> <laughs> with these comparisons. <laughs> We had okay, so the band was it was me on drum, my friend Chad on bass. Yeah. Um, this kid named Carmichael on uh singing. He was a really, really short, scrawny kid. Yeah. And then my friend 
uh, Genevieve, who's the only one out of us who actually knew how to play. Yeah. She played the flute. So basically, <laughs> the three of us like make this awful racket, me banging drums, trying, yeah. trying to play bass, and Carmichael trying to sing, sounding awful. And then there was these super beautiful flute <laughs> melodies over all of it. Right? And so it did did have this kind of absurdist uh, part of it. That aspect sounds it. great. Um, well, so what made you get, this sounds super promising. What, what made you guys give up on the on the dream? I went to grad school. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and so, the story ended. Yeah, or I think Genevieve went to grad school first. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so the musician left the band. Yeah, the musician <laughs> left the band, and there wasn't much left. Oh, uh, well, they, yeah, we're called the Pink Poodles. The Pink Poodles, and yeah. that is in reference to? Um, actually, my friend John made it up, uh, and I don't know if he was aware where he got it, but it may, it may have been a reference to the girl gang in uh, Greece. In Greece, yeah. yeah. Yeah, pinky Cus Tustadero or Custadero, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, all right. Well well that's a great way to kind of end this podcast, you know. So uh, you know, uh thank you, Veradic. Yeah. From Pink Poodles to Economics at Lion College. Uh, and all things in between. We've we've covered the globe. And so with that, I'll just uh, uh thank everyone for listening to the Career Pathways podcast. I Cannot close the show without asking producer Jason, how exactly do you find the Career Pathways podcast? You search it up. No, um, <laughs> you can find the Career Pathways podcast on all platforms, uh, 99.97% of platforms. It is the amount of bacteria killed by Germex. Um, so there you go. So we were we talking, we're talking international and global, and so is the Career Pathways podcast. There you have the voice of authority. So thank you very much, and we hope you keep listening to us, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Okay. This broadcast is sponsored in part by Lion College and by Kilt Studios. Holy three pages? Oh, man, I, I was prepped. Here. All right. Yeah. No, it's a. I. I right. so. Yeah. Okay. This is, and in the previous podcast, notice it was like hiding all this. <laughs> yeah. You did that on purpose. It's funny enough, because I had it up where it was like you can see it, and then you went and you slumped. No, I think it's just me relaxing. Yeah, you're yeah. getting relaxing, yeah, yeah. and it kind of took over, it covered yeah. your face.